Welcome to the Common Good Podcast, a conversation at the intersection of remembering, belonging, and place. I'm your host, Rabbi Miriam Turlinchamp. The framework for the podcast is the relationship of Walter Brueggemann, Peter Block, and John McKnight. For this episode, because of the pandemic, we're continuing to draw on the wisdom of Walter, Peter, and John. This conversation was recorded last week. We jump into the conversation with Peter asking about the collapse of the consumer culture and the shift of totalizing narratives. In some ways, we have departed the consumer culture. No place to shop. This is very confronting. I was thinking, Walter, you talked about us living within the totalizing narrative. Call it pharaoh, call it empire. The consumer culture is what we've been calling it. What happens now? Do we? How do you live outside of a totalizing narrative? Or do you just shift narrative? I do think we are in process of shifting narratives, but I don't think we can see very clearly how to move to a new narrative or a different narrative, because the, the obvious alternative is the neighborhood, but you can't do the neighborhood if you can't get out of your house. And, it, you know, it intensifies the sense that the way I relate is through the internet. A lot of people are being... <laughs> introduced to or invaded by a, a sense that if we really want to relate to each other, yeah, we found a way to do it. And we might have been alone, but, but the computer solved the problem. What reliance I, on, the, on the computer does is to put even more power and control in the big research engines. Uh, so that can't be good for us. I don't think the interaction through the computer is sustainable. In some ways, it deepens my isolation. Because how long can I be entertained before I have to live my life? I find myself doubling my yoga practice, which I find rewarding. Now, I like to be able to see it and have somebody lead me on a machine. It's really kind of puzzling to me. I mean, I see my family now once a week, but I don't feel closer to them. <laughs> Suppose we were weaned from our electronic addiction. We didn't shop for entertainment. What would that be like? What would our belief system consist of if we didn't have this crutch? When was it in the Old Testament that people went through a period of, of aloneness and isolation? When they uh, felt abandoned by their community, uh, if they felt uh, shunned or excluded or uncared for. And uh, in the book of Psalms, there's a lot of statements about stuff like that. What the Psalms do is imagine or assert that when you're abandoned by everyone else, the God who occupies this narrative is presently available. But that depends on having that powerful narrative. It's the whole narrative of the covenant with its miracles and its promises and its requirements. You know, in uh, in Scotland, in the clan system, the worst thing that could happen would be that you would be put into isolation, but not in the group, in exile. They had a name for people who were exiled, and it was broken men, yeah. broken men. It's a really interesting thing. In a, in a way, we are face-to-face -face broken men. And uh, what do we know about how did they manage? Well, they probably, they hardly did, right? They hardly did manage. Sure, they were the, the early gypsies of living as nomads, I suppose. Walter, I wanted to ask uh, this question. I sent you a note asking you what would make a neighborhood or a place a sacred place? And you wrote back a two-sentence definition that was uh, deep. And one of the characteristics you said of a sacred place is that it is a place of forgiveness. I was really surprised and taken by that of the things you would pick out. When I was a young man, I was a follower, A.J. Musty. He was my hero. 1943, on a hill outside of Schenectady, New York, uh, they had an Easter gathering. He stood up and he said, if I cannot love Hitler and forgive him, I can never be a Christian, and sat back down. So I just wanted to hear a little more. What's the centrality of forgiveness? I know that Hannah Arendt, the great uh, Jewish philosopher, 
has a footnote in one of her books in which she says that the great gift of the Christian tradition is not the resurrection, it's forgiveness. She says, as a Jew, that's the mark of Christian faith. And it seems to me that any sustainable, intimate community depends on forgiveness. And if there is not forgiveness, a community can't really flourish. If you think about a marriage or a family or any serious community. Going back to the the shift the new totality. I was thinking about forgiveness and mostly in the individualism world of personal growth, you say, well, it has to start with yourself. Maybe that's not useful. Maybe what's needed is for me to forgive Hitler or in the modern times to forgive the corporate world or the 1%. It would be interesting if we started there because I really think we are longing for a new totalizing belief system. And I think it is covenantal. I think it is communal. And then it will bleed into what kind of restaurants we have and what our downtown looks like. But maybe this is the beginning of a period of sustained isolation. And the next step is for me to use the electronics, but don't treat them as if they're useful. They're convenient. To me, the totalizing concept that I of empire today is convenience, not the 1%, not right. wealth disparity. Part of the reason there's so much poverty is we all want convenience. And I feel it's a strange time now. If you're marginalized and economically isolated, your life is much less different today than it was three months ago. People who are struggling every day for resources are still struggling. They're just as available. Now, there aren't people on the street I can ask money for, but every charity I know is super activated. Every homeless shelter, they're, they're opening hotels for homeless people. Yeah. If you're homeless or if you're on the edge, you're kind of getting on as you, as you did. I think the working class is who's being devastated. I also think another aspect of the consumer culture is the love of scale. If anything's been shrunk in my life, it's the idea of scale. Smaller and scarcer. I can't get broccoli. Peter, one of the things that always is a sign to me that I'm talking to somebody or the world of our interests the pale is when they say, well, John, well, let's scale up the managerial motto. Well, let's scale up. And the other one, one that goes with it is we're going to roll it out. <laughs> Those are the two stools, two legs of the stool called consumer culture. One is yes. scale, one is convenience, <laughs> and one is if you're inside the technology world, they call it a frictionless world. You know what friction constitutes in terms of doing commerce in a technology world? There's a human being involved. They always slow things down. Their goal is to say, how do I buy and sell and communicate and exchange in a frictionless way? All of a sudden, in the last three, four years, artificial intelligence has become valuable because yeah. the promise is a frictionless world. My wants are so predictable, and they have people, data scientists, tracking our language system. And they call it intents. And they want a list, Walter, of every intent you have at this moment of your life. And once they know your intent, they can automate all responses to it. So if you want to buy a shirt, if you want to pay a bill, if you want to order groceries, if I know that ahead of time, we don't need a person to give you what you want. This is, the, to me, the, what we're in search of a, a different thing to lean on. And I, and I just have the feeling, that even in this conversation, that, well, John, you talk about the band, the shunned, the broken man, the broken person. And you talk about the isolation, you know, where all I have left is the covenant with God. And maybe that's what's ahead of us and, and until we have some comfort with that. So if you, if you think about a frictionless world and you bring up the subject of forgiveness, can that transpire in a frictionless world? No, because it's been automated. It has the language only, but it has no variability. It was meant to be, which means it wasn't a choice. A world without freedom, even though all of my intentions may be realized. I think forgiveness is an immutable channel or funnel by which we go through into, into an alternative future, which is what we've all spent our lives on, is creating an alternative future. You know, the, uh, the Reformation of Luther was triggered by the church's uh, attempt to commoditize forgiveness through indulgence. And uh, Luther rebelled against that commoditization. And that, that sounds like a very uh, 
a contemporary effort. I could imagine uh, contemporary people trying to figure out a way to, to commoditize forgiveness. I think the forgiveness and covenant in that language precedes any discussion of, of what the uh, consumer world will look like. It won't require faith That's to right. be in the conversation. It's too small a hurdle. You've been listening to the Common Good Podcast, a conversation at the intersection of remembering, belonging, and place. As we consider the power of forgiveness, we hope these words by Yehuda Amichai will embolden you during this time. It's called The Place Where We Are Right. From the place where we are right, flowers will never grow in the spring. The place where we are right is hard and trampled like a yard. But doubts and loves dig up the world like a mole, a plow and a whisper will be heard in the place where the ruined house once stood. Let's return to the conversation as Peter shifts to discussing the importance of proclamation in bringing about the common good. You still are so committed to the preacher. John and I have tried to wean you away, but I'm interested in what your uh, ongoing love and commitment. Talk a little bit about the, the pain you're speaking into, why it's still so compelling to you. It seems to me that at its best, we had courage and imagination ought to be the final place in society where a new word can be uttered that breaks open all of our certitudes. Now, that doesn't happen very often because preachers are timid for good reason, but ideally, it is proclamation of something astonishing that cannot be contained in our normal presuppositions. A word that breaks open the shell of certainty. And I think certainty is another leg. This is a seven-legged stool. Theologically, the center of Christian preaching is to stand up and say, Christ is risen. And that means is that the empire could not eliminate the threat that Jesus constituted in the Roman Empire. It is an astonishing piece of news that blows everything open. The function of preaching in in Christian tradition cannot be separated from the substance of the narrative. So it gets back to uh, you as a preacher standing up as a an alternative, an act of imagination to declare you do have enough. You don't need it right away. The negative part is that the, the totalizing narrative to which you are committed cannot make you safe and it cannot make you happy. That's its false promise. That's the appeal of certainty. Christian preaching is the claim that we know a better way to safety and happiness. But wouldn't that be true about any preaching? Is it all dependent on, the, on Christ? I mean, substantively, claims of Judaism, Islam, and Christian faith are not equivalents. They they do very different things, but you could imagine all of them being the subject of proclamation. So the alternative narrative, then, is that there is another way towards safety and happiness. John, this has been your your ministry from forever. And instead of Jesus rising, which you've only come to talk about lately, for obvious reasons, okay, we're all suddenly interested. You know, uh, the proclamation is is rare, probably, because there's such a heavy sanction against doing that. I was wondering whether or not the word sanction and sanctuary and sacred somehow are related. A sanction always sounds restrictive and, and negative. All that we're talking about happens so rarely because the obvious cultural sanction is surrounding us, is muting us all of the time. I, I really wonder if you thought about people who did stand up, why did they do it? The prophets were always standing up. It seems to be very strange and very hidden about the religious experience that the prophets claim to have had that compelled them to speak this stuff. The evidence is such that they didn't want to do it, but they felt compelled, and they didn't want to do it because they knew it was risky. They knew to step outside of conventional certitudes (laughs) can get yourself hurt. A friend of mine, Warner Earhart, he says the listening creates the speaking. And so when he's in the world, he is attuned to and responsive to the listening. And I think maybe the listening is part of what creates the prophet. Then we could say, what's, 
what's the shift in our listening now that creates space? What you hope happens is that the people who hear the preaching compute, therefore we are permitted to act differently. We can act differently because the world is occupied in ways that we hadn't recognized. I wanted to go back to uh, forgiveness for a minute, if I can, and ask, is there, if you could imagine, a sustainable neighborhood where uh, forgiveness was embodied in the culture? What are the rituals? Uh, what would we look at as the way we recognize the importance of forgiveness Maybe even celebrate it. I mean, how, how it goes back to Peter's great revelation to me about how we don't want kind people. We want a, a community that calls forth kindness, right? We don't want a forgiving person. What we want is a community that calls forth forgiveness. What is it that uh, enabled forgiveness? What, what are the signs, methods? Well, I think the... The signs of forgiveness are generosity, hospitality, and finally economic justice, which I guess is why Peter has been at work on Jubilee all this time. The most extreme dramatic form of forgiveness is the cancellation of debts. You know, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. I think you can add the restoration of land because the modern form of Pharaoh is control of the land, not control of right. means of production. The, the world has gone from producing things to real estate. For this moment, hospitality seems to be a contemporary version of forgiveness. They're almost one and the same thing. The welcoming of the stranger, which you've talked about for years, John. At the heart of the matter, if I want economic justice, I must welcome the stranger. I can't grow my charity. I can't build forgiveness on philanthropy or charity or services. I have to build it on welcome, the welcoming of the stranger. And then you have places like parts of Germany, it's kind of stunning, that are still welcoming immigrants. Every other country in the world, keeping them out, kicking them out. To me, that's this is what I want from my preacher, a beacon or a call. John's spoken that a community, a neighborhood isn't a community unless it has a welcoming at the edge. And Livingston said, these are the modern prophets. And, and Livingston is a modern prophet in my mind, because when I asked her, for the last 10 years, you've helped organize addicts in Vancouver, put them into places of service, give them clean ways. Has it reduced addiction? And she said, Peter, that question never occurred to me. Yeah. It was so deeply embarrassing to me. <laughs> yeah. Rather than what miracle she came to describe to us. Maybe I got it from you, one of you, but the future always exists in the present. The way that got expressed in the Christian tradition is that Jesus' initial proclamation was to say, the kingdom of God is already at hand. The kingdom of God is that promised future. And he said, it's here. It's here in my person. If you want to know about it, watch me. In one way, his intention with full of forgiveness and hospitality was met with sanctions. In of all the forms of aggression as you can think of, it seems to me Jesus was not much associated with them, right? Even that didn't protect him. He got sanctioned for doing everything has to do with hospitality, welcoming. Yeah. You know, I also just had the image of Jesus being crucified. Who was he with at the time? It was prisoners, right? It seems to me that in this strange vile virus era, one of the things we're doing is releasing prisoners. Isn't that amazing? And somehow the prison population, uh, the ultimate act of hospitality would be to get release 80% of the people in prison. That's the hardest work of all is to deal with our prison population. Well, I think, Peter, that it's worth you uh, doing some thinking about the, the public dimensions of forgiveness, what that signifies and how it works, yeah. because no doubt what the church has done is to privatize forgiveness. Well, I, will, I will take on that assignment, uh, knowing that all three of us will forget it, so I don't feel <laughs> You know the story about, about forgetting that this old man was going to bring his wife breakfast in bed 
And she said, I'll write this down. No, he won't write it down. So I want bacon and eggs and coffee. He brought her tea and oatmeal. She said, I didn't think you would remember. <laughs> exactly. You know, working on this common good idea that was sparked by you guys along with you. What I'm imagining is we create a university or a discipline. It's called the common good. We take slices from all these other disciplines, but this is something you could go and study. And then get a bachelor's degree, a master's, a PhD, and gold wings from the Boy Scouts. Okay, Eagles, Eagle Scout <laughs> in the common good. Thanks for listening. Before we go, we want to bring attention to an upcoming offering from the Common Good Collective. In this time of social isolation, we're becoming increasingly aware of our interconnectedness and the need we all share for true connection. And yet we have a long way to go, and have come a long way, to recognize the importance of inclusion of those with disabilities. With that in mind, check out the show notes for links to the Common Good Collective's reader and a conversation with Al Etmansky on April 27th at the Common Good Collective's Abundant Community Conversation. The Common Good is hosted by me, Rabbi Miriam Turlenship, and produced by the incredible Joey Taylor with music from Jeff Gorman.